So Kant, it looks like can't, but it's Kant. He is chapter 11 and I'm coming back to him now. I did mill before and now I'm doing Kant. You can probably read them in whichever order, but I think that uh, approaching ethics is probably easier to get into from mill than Kant. And uh, I had mentioned before that with Descartes, he ushered in a brand new time frame, which we call the modern time period. And this began with Descartes and it ended with Kant. And we're skipping over some of the guys in the middle just from time. We have Hume that you have a chapter on if you want to read. He was a big skeptic. And this is when you had people like Locke and Leibniz and Berkeley and a lot of people do that were doing things in philosophy of language and political philosophy and logic and mathematics and all sorts of stuff. There's a lot happening within philosophy and outside of it. And Kant came along and changed the game again. And aside from Aristotle, Kant has probably had the biggest overall influence on Western philosophy, but Kant is very difficult. And not that the philosophers we've looked at before have necessarily been super easy to read, but by comparison, Kant was very obscure and your book points this out, uh, that he was not afraid that people would prove him wrong. He was afraid that people wouldn't understand him. And Kant was a peculiar fellow and he never really traveled outside of like a 40 mile radius of the town that he was from, which was unusual at the time when philosophers were traveling around and giving guest lectures and things like that. And he didn't really have a whole lot of contact with the outside world. He didn't get married and he didn't have children. He was kind of a loner and would hole up in his apartment and write pretty much all day. And the only time he really ever went anywhere is every day he went for a walk at the exact same time. And he walked the exact same path every single day and was such a creature of habit in that way that it said that everybody else in the town set their clocks based off of his daily walks. Um, he also was raised in a denomination of Christianity that definitely stressed uh, guilt and shame. And I think that stuck with him a little bit. And he contributed to a ton of different things in philosophy that are way too complex to try to get into in an online setting, especially with time. So I'm going to focus particularly on his ethic viewpoints, which are discussed in the chapter uh, there's a lot of other stuff in the chapter about him that hopefully you read, uh, but I'm not going to expect you to know all of that stuff. So his ethical viewpoints are actually not based on anything religion oriented at all. And if you are interested between this connection between religion and morality, I highly recommend you take an ethics class because there's a lot of problems with claims about, uh, without God or without religion, there's no foundation for morality and all sorts of other claims like that, that you might hear when you think of the connection. So there's a lot of ethics classes that I recommend that you take. But for Kant, with Mill, we just got a really easy, are you making people happy? Awesome. Are you not making people happy? Not awesome. Now, it obviously wasn't that simplistic, but compared to Kant, it's a very, very simplistic procedure to apply. Kant is going to give us a much more complex system that has three separate components as opposed to just one. And each of these three is going to be a little bit more detailed as well. Now, the bad thing about it being more complicated is that we have a lot more to consider and it's not as easy to understand and apply. But the good thing about it is that it's more, has some fail safes built in. So going back to Mill, if all we care about is making people happy, I maybe can make a lot of people happy by killing, I don't know, somebody that's just kind of like a jerk that annoys everybody. And if more people are happy that that guy's dead and the misery that he caused is now not in the world anymore, then utilitarian might have to tell me to do it. Uh, but that's not okay. I mean, you can't just kill somebody because he's annoying, obviously, even if people are happy about it. So with a three-step complicated ethical theory like Kant's, things that maybe will fall through one of the cracks are going to get caught up in one of the other ones. So it's going to have fewer exceptions than Mills. Now that being said, it's still not perfect, but uh, it's going to be a very different way of looking at ethics. So we have three components here. And the first one that I want to talk about, I'm going to go it's slightly out of order here, but I'm going to give you page numbers for your textbook. So the first one is what we call the categorical imperative. Now first we have a hypothetical imperative, and an imperative is just a rule that you give yourself. A hypothetical imperative is a rule that applies to you hypothetically, if you care about the outcome. So if you want to get an A in this class, then you need to study and take it seriously and do all the work on time, etc. 
Now that only applies to you if you care about, if you're in this class and if you care about getting an A. So that's not going to apply to most of the people in the world. Same thing if you want to lose weight, move more, eat less, make healthier food choices, whatever, right? That only applies to you if you actually want to lose weight. Now we can contrast these hypothetical imperatives with what Kant called the categorical imperative, and this is on page 334. Now the categorical imperative applies to everybody, regardless of whether or not you care. And the categorical imperative is the moral obligation stuff. So some of us maybe feel like we can choose whether or not we want to be a good person. And we maybe feel like it's a good thing to decide to try to be moral and virtuous, but you can choose to be an immoral jerk if you want. And maybe we suspect that you'll be held accountable either by the legal system, depending on what you do, or maybe in some sort of justice after you die for afterlife or whatever. But most of us feel like that's kind of a free choice in the same way that I can choose to be a healthy person or choose to get extremely overweight and not really care. Um, but not Kant. He thought that we all had an obligation and a duty to be moral just because we're human and because we are rational. So the categorical imperative is, in Kant's language, and then I'll explain it, act in such a way as if the maxim of the action were to become through your will a universal law. What in the world is that mean? First, the maxim part. Maxim is not just kind of a trashy magazine. It's, uh, a, it's a rule that you live by, that you give yourself. Kind of like an imperative. Now, what we're asked to do is to imagine that the moral rules that we are acting upon were held by everybody. So it becomes a universal law. Everybody has the same rule. So if I have a maxim that I'm not going to steal things that don't belong to me, then that's a rule I give myself. Now, the categorical imperative asks us to imagine if everybody in the world shared that same maxim. Now, the next thing that we want to ask is not, would you want to live in that world? Would you like it? Anything subjective whatsoever. So it may be around some people of the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you want them to do unto you. There's really good things about that. Anybody can apply it, even a child. It's really easy. It forces us to be empathetic. That's how we teach morality to children. Right? You can't hit your sibling because you don't want them to hit you. But there's problems with this as a moral guideline because it's all based on what you personally want. And there are people that would want to be, I don't know, abused or something like that because there are people that enjoy being mistreated. Uh, you can imagine maybe a Nazi who's so dedicated to the cause that he would say, I would want somebody to kill me if I was Jewish or something like that. There's a danger in making morality just whatever you want goes, which is kind of what the golden rule ultimately does. Now, most people wouldn't want other people to treat them poorly, so it's not usually an issue, but Kant saw the dangers in that. So the categorical imperative, we imagine everybody not did the same action, but followed the same rule, the same maxim. And then we ask, not do I want to live there, not would I like it, nothing subjective at all. I'm going to be hard on you on the quiz if you say this, because I'm trying to stress, because it's a common misconception. Instead, what we want to ask is, would my original goal be accomplished? So here's an example. There are some people, you might be one of these people, who, let's say, drive on the shoulder when there's a lot of traffic to get where they're going faster. Right? They just ignore that that's against the law, and they drive on the shoulder to bypass everybody to try to get where they're going quickly. Now, the moral rule that you're following in this case, and it's obviously moral rules are not super specific to context or generalized rules, like you can't lie and things like that. So the rule here would essentially be the maxim, I can break the rules of the road whenever I'm going to benefit from doing so. Now, we imagine that everybody in the world follows this moral rule, that they can violate the rules of the road if they're going to benefit from it. Now we ask ourselves... Would my original goal be accomplished? Well, the original goal was to get where you're going quickly, right? To get there faster by breaking the rule of the road. But if everybody is breaking the laws of the road whenever they feel like they'd benefit from it, you wouldn't get where you're going any faster because there would be people all over the shoulder, all over the road doing all kinds of crazy things and you wouldn't get where you're going quickly or any more quickly. 
So what this means is the only reason you benefit from that action is because nobody else, or at least most people, aren't doing it, which means you've made an exception for yourself and you are holding others to a higher standard than you're holding yourself to. And that means that you are being inconsistent in the application of morality and you're also being irrational by assuming that you're somehow an exception and what makes you more important than anybody else. So with the categorical imperative, we imagine everybody else shares this moral rule and see if we can consistently benefit in the way that we think we would. So take a different example. So let's say I have a maxim that if I have extra money left over after I pay my bills, that I should donate it to charity and give back if you can do so. Now, if everybody else in the world shared that maxim and they donated when they could afford to, my goal absolutely would be accomplished because a lot more people would be helped out. It wouldn't affect me being able to help people in any way. It would just actually benefit a lot more people. So it passes. I'm not making an exception. I'm not being inconsistent or irrational, and it's morally right. If it doesn't pass the categorical imperative and I'm only benefiting by making an exception for myself, then it's morally wrong. So that's step one. Step two is called the principle of dignity. It's also sometimes called the categorical imperative, but don't get yourself even more confused. And this is on page 336. Uh, and this tells us that we need to treat others, uh, our, or humanity, in our own person and in others as ends and never as means only. So treating somebody as an end versus treating them as a means. If you treat somebody as a means, you're using them for whatever they can do for you. They're literally a means to an end. And you might be using them for money or a place to stay or sex or a ride or whatever it is uh, that you are using them for. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of, of being used by somebody for something, you know that it sucks and that it feels unfair. So we don't want to treat people just as a means. We want to treat them as an end in and of themselves. And that means treating them with dignity, which is why it's the principle of dignity, and respect, regardless of whether they can benefit me at all, because they're a person and they're rational and human beings are unbelievably valuable. Now, we treat others as means all the time. I'm a means for you to get credits and closer to, to a degree. You're a means for me to have a paycheck and have a job. And that's fine as long as we're still treating each other as human beings and we're being respectful throughout that. So your waitress is a means to food and your plumber is a means to, you know, an unproblematic sink. And that's fine. It's not treating them as a means only or a mere means. You still have to respect them throughout the process. So it's not enough to just use the categorical imperative to stay consistent. We also need to treat people in a specific way. We can't use them for how they're going to benefit us just because we can benefit from them. We have to treat them with dignity and respect in the process, even if they can't do anything for us. And then the third component here is the one that's kind of glossed over and not as clearly defined. You don't have like a little vocabulary box like you do with the other two, but that is acting from the goodwill, which is the section heading on page 330. So I'm going a little bit out of order here. So from the goodwill, this is about our motivation. So remember that Mill was all about the outcome. That's it. Your intention didn't matter at all for Mill. It was just your outcome and if you're making people happy. Kant is the opposite extreme. All motivation, all intention, outcome doesn't matter. So we have to act from what he called the goodwill, which means you have to do the right thing for the right reason and the right reason is it's the right thing to do. Now, that's a little bit confusing, but at the bottom line here, what he means is you don't do the right thing because you want to brag about it on social networking and have people think you're great, because you want to impress a member of the opposite sex, because you want to get a tax write-off, or it's community service, or looks good on an application, or makes you feel good about yourself. Or all those other reasons why people might do things. Or because you want to go to heaven and not hell if you're thinking long term, right? None of those things are good reasons for doing the right thing. Instead, you do it because it's the right thing to do and you have an obligation to do what is right. right? We all have a moral obligation to do the right thing. And at the end of the day, that's what matters for Kant. So we've got three components here. 
that all need to go together. It's a little bit complex, but hopefully I've helped explain it a little bit. Avoid the internet. That'll make it worse. Uh, and let me know if you have any questions.